of time, can we give the Lord a huge round of applause for while he's doing it? We love you, Lord. Now, I believe that God has got something to say to you today. How many of you are in agreement with that? I believe, uh, I'm just saying, you might not get anything if you don't. Uh, I really do believe that God has got something uh, incredibly uh, important to say to us. And so for the last uh, four weeks, we have been in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapter 5 through 7, and we've been unpacking it verse by verse. And so today where we stand is Matthew 5, verse 10 through 12 is the next few verses in our progression. And so I believe God is gonna work in our hearts. So let's get right to the scripture if you wanna pull it out. Matthew 5, we'll go to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When I wrote this message a couple months ago, uh, God revealed to me that it is really hard to be indifferent to a wide awake Christian. Even more so, it's, it's really hard to be indifferent towards a passionate, sold out, authentic child of God, right? And so it can be even more difficult to be indifferent to a, a whole body of wide awake Christians. You can hate them, um, you can love them, but you're just simply not able to ignore them. You just really can't. Because there's something about them that won't allow you to do that. Uh, it may not be what they say or what they do, but the thing that haunts you is a little bit of who they are, right? Why? Because an authentic Christian confronts you with an entirely different way to do life, a new way of thinking, a new way of being, a new set of values, a higher standard of righteousness. In short, they face you with the kingdom of God on earth and you have to accept it or you have to reject it. You can't just dismiss or wash your hands like Pilate did of them. You will either want to crown them or you will want to crucify them. For either they will be really right or they will be really wrong, right? And so to those who have loyalty to a different kind of kingdom, in this whole series, we've been talking about how to become citizens of God's kingdom, citizens of the God reality that he has for you and me, citizens of his kingdom, uh, but to those who have a loyalty to a different kingdom, the kingdom of our culture, to the culture of our world, to those who are a part of the kingdom of God, those people will appear like subversive agents. Do you, ever, do you realize that um, you might be a little bit more like James Bond than you realize? Except just please don't be a womanizer. Just, just the, the PG version of James Bond, please. If there is such a thing, I don't think there is. Anyway, but, but God has called you, whether you realize it or not, to be a little bit of a subversive agent. You've been, been called to be a little bit of a subversive agent. Dangerous enemies, if you will, to a kingdom system that typically is not tolerated. Uh, to those who are part of a worldly culture, you don't look like subversive agents to them because the kingdom of God runs contrary, runs opposite to the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus knew that, that this was going to be a reality for you, for me, for all of us, and so he did his best to prepare these kingdom agents for what would inevitably come. Like Jesus is going through the Beatitudes and he's reading all these things for him and everybody's being like, say what? You want us to do what? You want us to say what? And, and as we read these Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, we're like, this stuff's really, really hard. This is not easy stuff. Why? Because it's going against our natural way of thinking, our natural way of being a citizen within this world. And Jesus is like, I want you to be born again as a new citizen in the new kingdom. But, but as you're born into this and as you start living out this Sermon of the Mount reality, you start living out these verses, Jesus did his best to prepare us as kingdom agents for what would come. 
persecution. If you start living this stuff out, Jesus like, you know, it's gonna be tough at times. I like how Clarence Jordan translates the verse that we just read. Check it out. It says that they who have endured much for what's right are God's people. They're citizens of his new order. You are all God's people when others call you names and harass you and tell you all kinds of false tales on you just because you follow me. Be cheerful and good humored because your spiritual advantage is great. For that is the way they treated men of conscience in the past. So what we have to understand is God is not looking for you or for me to just go out there and get ourselves persecuted. Just saying that for a friend. The point here isn't that you're not a good Christian unless you get persecuted. Um, God isn't looking for you or me to go out and have like this martyr complex where we're trying to, you know, um, where we're desiring, where we're going after persecution. Because here's what happens. When you have a martyr complex, uh, you live with self-pity. You start to have this victim mentality. And, and in Jesus Christ, we're no longer victims. We have the victory, amen? That, that's the new reality we have as kingdom of citizens. And so what happens is all these mentalities, though, they are signs of spiritual decay. God's like, no, 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 that's not what I have for you. This kind of thinking will lead people to actually persecute themselves if they can't get anyone else in the world to do it for them. Maybe, maybe you walk on a bed of hot coals. Maybe you, are, you sleep on a bed of spikes. Or in the first world century, first world country, maybe you wear a shirt of hurt feeling, bitterness, offense. Here's what I've learned. You guys ready with what I've learned? All right, well, that's good. Five of us are. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter much what hurts these type of people just so long as they are hurt and they feel that they have a reason to feel sorry for themselves. I love how Clarence Jordan kind of sums it up. He says that a person has to suffer for a cause even if it's just because. But Jesus, Jesus was a visionary. He was a visionary, but also he was the world's biggest realist as well too. And let me explain, because Jesus was not naive about how living out this, this Sermon on the Mount, he wasn't naive about how to live out this kingdom reality would cost us. Living the Sermon on the Mount would actually affect others around us. He understood that. And so that's why he inserts this verse. And, and so one time, Jesus is obviously delivering a message. It's a different context, a different environment. And he's preaching. And he says some really hard things. He actually makes it about communion, makes some very hard statements. And, and a bunch of his followers turn away and say, this is a hard teaching, and they leave him. They no longer follow him any longer. And I can just feel the tension in the moment. Here's what scripture says. Jesus turns to his disciples, and he asks them this question. Feel the, feel the hurt, like just a, a, almost like a grieving sorrow. Not wrong, but a grieving sorrow. He looks at his disciples and says, are you gonna leave me too? God's kingdom of spirit and truth is the mortal enemy of systems of this world that are built on power, greed, oppression, and falsehood. And so the two are going to butt heads. These two systems will never be at peace with each other. I mean, we have cute bumper stickers that say coexist, and that sounds nice, but let me tell you why that will never work, because one system one kingdom always will take over the other. That's how kingdoms work. And so Paul says it like this. In 2 Timothy 3.12, it says this, indeed, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, now stop, 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 stop. I'm gonna take a vote because you're good Americans, right? And Americans like to vote. 
or Republican, Democrat, you like to vote, or whatever, just Christians like to vote. How many in the room would like to live a godly life in Jesus Christ? Raise your hand, please. Just lie if that's not you. No, I'm kidding, don't lie, that would be bad. That would be the opposite of living a godly life. Don't do that, right? All right, so we're saying, hey, I wanna live a godly life. What does it say? Will be persecuted. It's kind of par for the course. That's what the apostle is saying to young Timothy, Paul is saying to young Timothy here. And so Jesus talks about persecution, but he doesn't tell his disciples to go out there and make the persecution worse. Don't poke the bear. Don't make the storm you're in crazier. It's like, hey, you're gonna have some crazy storms. That's a reality, but you don't have to make it worse. And nor did Jesus try to comfort them by telling them that, hey guys, you're not gonna face any storms ever. Once you get your life right with Jesus, with me, you come to me, you're not gonna face any storms. No, he doesn't say that at all. Jesus also didn't say that, hey guys, I know you've had a bad day. Get some sleep, eat some carbs. And when you wake up, the sun will be shining, the birds will be chirping, and everything will have just taken care of itself. He doesn't say that. But sometimes we as Christians, we live with that's the reality. That's how it should always work out. But Jesus wasn't that naive, nor was Jesus gullible, right? I love the brutal honesty of Jesus. Can I tell you why I love it so much? Because it gives me hope that despite the challenges, despite the setbacks, despite the difficult times that we all face, that Jesus is like, this is par for the course. You're right where you need to be. That's your Jesus. And it gives me a lot of hope. Jesus said something like this. Let me give you a paraphrase. Friends, this is it. You think you've already been through a lot, but you're just getting started. As you walked up these beatitude steps and came into my kingdom, I made it clear to you that you were making an all-out commitment. I'm telling you today to be faithful to no matter, be faithful to me no matter what the cost. Don't let the world scare you or bully you or make you back down. Rejoice that you have been counted worthy to be on my side. You're in great company of the prophets whose glorious past stretches back to the beginning of time and whose future has no end. So go to it. I am with you, amen? I mean, that's the reality. That's the promise we have in Jesus Christ. I like to put it like this. Persecution is a terrible thing, but unfaithfulness is far worse, right? I mean, I wanna be faithful to God. I wanna honor him. I wanna make sure that I'm listening to him and I'm obeying what he says. Persecution, man, yeah, it is a terrible thing, but unfaithfulness, far worse. Most of us, though, if we're honest, we really don't deal with stiff persecution. I mean, think about it. We're not losing our lives like other believing brothers and sisters around the globe. I mean, when a Muslim or oftentimes a Hindu comes to their faith in Christ, they're packing their bags because their family's no longer talking to them any longer. I mean, it, it is a change of total direction, and even home. Um, but... This idea of persecution actually has a wide range to it. A good translation of the word persecution in this verse is actually harass. Like Jesus is saying, blessed are the harassed. Blessed are the harassed. This is why verse 11 kind of shows the range. It expands it. it. It talks about it. It says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all things, kinds of evil against you because of me. See, what we understand is that persecution can go to physical extremes like we have seen in the church's bloody, martyred history. But most often, it comes in the form of verbal harassment, sometimes audible, sometimes whispered, sometimes direct, sometimes innuendo. Verbal abuse and social ostracism uh, may require just as much bravery from the Christian as the Christians of old who were thrown into the Roman Colosseums. It's 
pretty stout statement when you think about it. And I'd like to back it up with something that my parents used to say to me growing up. I would hear them say something to the effect of, um, you know, Josh, so many people believe that they would die for Jesus, but they don't seem to have the bravery to live for him. It's convicting, isn't it? See, here's the question. Like a lot of us, we feel like we need to ask, would I die for Jesus? Like if you're honest, if you've served God for longer than a few years, somehow that question always seems to pop up. But I don't think God's asking you if you'll die for him today. The question is, will you live for him today? In in your workspace, in your family, with your kids, with that difficult person, in the culture that we're, we're living with, with your banker, all these different things, will you live for him with bravery today? He's asking. Living for Christ is often hard. Jesus makes that really clear. But hard doesn't make it bad. Hard doesn't make it wrong. Christ says the challenge is worth it. It's worth it. This is the way to live. This really is blessed. Blessed. Persecution can take other forms as well. And I wanna give a few scenarios. Maybe you found yourself, you'll find yourself in one of these. Maybe for the conscientious worker in business, they've diligently worked for the last 20 years and they've been passed over for promotion over and over and over again because, well, the C-suite is uncomfortable with persons of uncompromising ethics. Or maybe you're a college student in the room or online who has ultimately been removed from conversations with friends because the friends won't agree with all that you say or you won't agree with all that they say. Or maybe, maybe you're a housewife in the room and you're not invited to all the different social gatherings that are going on in the neighborhood. You're considered boring by the neighbors because you won't delight in the gossip and the backbiting going on. I've said this before, but I think the future of Christianity is gonna look more and more like Christians will become the social minority. We're gonna become more and more like the social minority. We're gonna become more and more like the fringe of society. We're gonna be more and more considered weird. Jesus calls us a unique people. Other translation, weird. (laughs) Some of you have more of that gift than others, and that might not be as much God as you think it is, but so I digress. (laughs) But what's gonna happen in our society, and we're already seeing it, right? Um, More people will be canceled and silenced. More people will be deemed, Christians will be deemed not Insta-worthy. Christians who actually have a high reputation in our world, uh, high, high fame, if you will, will have to manage, uh, they're gonna have to manage their reputation and they're gonna have a really hard time uh, because they're either gonna have to blend in and bow to culture or they're gonna have to stick out like a sore thumb. Because an authentic believer, it's hard. It's a little bit weird. That's what God's called us to be. Often in America, though, um, persecution for us is pretty light. If we're just honest with ourselves, why? Why is persecution light in America? Well, I think it's because most of us, we kind of just, well, keep our faith private. We keep our faith private. Hidden Christianity may be not Christianity at all. Because if something really has changed inside of you, how do you keep it from not spilling out of you? It's kind of the message last week, right? And so the reason why there is so little persecution in the church today, in the American church, the Western church, um, and Christians in general in the West is, honestly, we look a lot like the surrounding world. We just do. I do as well too. That's not an accusation. I'm I'm a part of us. What doctor and theologian uh, Kent Hughes says about this whole thing is crazy convicting. 
When I read it, it kind of punched me in the gut. So are you ready to get your toes stepped on and punched on the gut a little bit? I just, I want, I want you to be able to flex. It's like you're before the, the little kid sucker punches you. Here we go. All right. He says this, if you want to get along, the formula is simple. Approve of the world's morals and ethics, at least outwardly. Live like the world lives. Laugh at its humor. Immerse yourself in its entertainment. Smile innocently when God is mocked. Act as if all religions converge on the same road. Don't mention hell. Draw no moral judgments. Take no stand on moral or political issues. Above all, do not share your faith. Follow this formula and it will be smooth sailing. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kent. So if we look inwardly, if we're honest, we might ask ourselves, what are the things that we currently do that are worth persecuting? Usually, there isn't much. As we look, smell, act, think like everybody else. But as the church, we've often neglected to tell people that, hey, if you follow Jesus Christ, there's gonna be a price to pay. Like, it is hard. It is hard. It will affect how you get along with others at school. Like, I'm watching that with my kiddos. It, it will affect, and my son needs to know that. I've said to him, son, we're different. We're weird. You're not called to blend in. Um, it will affect your profile at the golf club, the country club. It will. Um, it will affect how you make a living. The early Christian church didn't doubt where the believer's loyalty should lie. And 100 years after Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, history records an interesting conversation uh, with uh, an early church father by the name of Tertullian. And he, if you read any old church history, this guy was pretty much a legend. And, um, and so what happened was uh, 100 years after Jesus preached this message, a man approached Tertullian, the early church father, and he asked him a question because he had a problem. And, and he, he basically said, hey, there, I've got some issues with my business interests and my Christianity. They're, they're conflicting. They're conflicted. And he ended his conversation with Tertullian by saying, what can I do? I must live. It's his quote. What must I do? I must live. Tertullian simply replied, must you? Tertullian believed that when a choice between loyalty to Christ and, and making a living conflicted, that the true believer of Jesus Christ would choose Jesus Christ. It wasn't a question. See, to choose Christ honestly is to find life. But to choose a life without Christ, that ultimately will lose it. The word of God says, what is a man to profit if he gains the whole world, but he loses their soul, right? And these are hard, conflicting things that Jesus is throwing right at us because he wants us to know that the tension is real and it's okay to be in this tension and he loves you through it and he's gonna be with you in it. Um, to the left of the aisle or to the last left seat on each row, there's a little bucket. Can you grab that, guys? And inside of it is a saltine. Can you pass it down your row for me? So I want everybody to get a saltine and go ahead and just pass them down. And you can open them up and we're gonna have a saltine break, if you don't mind. Uh, open it up, open it up. And I would love for you to just go ahead and eat your saltines. I know that they're just gonna be refreshing. No, this is not communion. That's not gonna be happening right now. This is not communion. <laughs> We have not downgraded. <laughs> Unless you're like gluten-free, then maybe don't. Sorry, we couldn't get those. But go ahead and eat it. Go ahead, go on. All right, this is your time. Some of you are holding out. Don't be that person. Come on, I see you. I see you. I'm watching you, Brian Porter. Oh, man. Wendy, eat your... Go ahead, this is why you came to church. You said today, I wanna be fed. You're welcome. You're welcome. The deep truths of God here at Cross Church. 
All right, as you're eating your saltines, let's just keep on reading the scripture. Um, I'm sorry, one second. How you all doing? Cool, I'm glad you're fine. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Yep. Now, most of us mentally stop here at this verse and we strut about and we start to think about how we are the salt of the earth. Like, yeah, I got it going on. Come on, I'm the salt of the earth. And, and, but this verse actually isn't so much a compliment as it is a strong warning. So let's keep reading. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So other translations say if a salt loses its, its strength or its savor, the word in the Greek here is translated to mean uh, to be foolish or to act foolishly. This is actually where, this Greek word is actually where we get the word moron. I'm not making this stuff up, folks, I promise you. It's where we get moron. And so let me accurately translate this verse for you using, from the Greek, using the JMV, the Josh Mail version. Here we go. It's accurate, I promise you. All right, here we go. You, you are the salt of the earth. But if we go around acting like foolish morons, how can the world become wise? <laughs> there you go. My Bible will be available next week. No, but that is an accurate rendering of that text, believe it or not. God says, hey, be salt. This verse is a strong warning to anyone who's a part of Jesus's kingdom. Jesus is saying, hey, you know what? Don't be foolish morons. Don't, stop it. Be salt. Be salt. The verse goes on to say, it is no longer good for anything. The saltine is moldy and stale except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. The book of Luke gives us the very same, trans, the same illustration, but says it this way. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless, flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. And so Jesus is saying here that when Christians lose their saltiness, people will no longer bother to persecute Christians. Actually, it's saying something much worse. It's not just that they won't persecute them. They will simply dump us out of their lives, out of their regular routines, and go about their daily business because the Christians are of no consequence. Jesus is giving us a warning giving me a warning. Jesus calls us to warn us, to tell us that we can lose our power to salt because salt should never be neutral, right? So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about a salt lick or salt water or saltine. Now, many of you in this room, you're refreshing Got, got a little something in the back. All right, yeah, now I'm good. And I would like us just to sit in that tension for a moment. I want you to feel the desire to want to go get a drink. Because this is exactly what Jesus asked for you and me to do and to be in our world. The tension that you feel right now of I gotta get this need met, that is what we are to be for our world. They sense in us assault that I, I don't know what it is, but when I'm around them, it makes me know I need something. I'm thirsty. And they find living water. It satisfies. Our lives should make the world thirsty for the real thing, Jesus Christ. See, we don't act like the tension, the persecution, the challenges that we face. We don't like those things, but this makes people outside of God's kingdom order wonder, I'm noticing them going through hard stuff. Why are they different than me? Why, 
Why are they responding differently? There's something that I need, something that they must have that I want. Jesus then gives an illustration in a different way in verse 14. He says, you are the lie of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under the bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Cross church, you were made to shine. You were made to shine. And, and that kingdom brightness may at times make other people wince. Said very clearly, it's like when you leave this building on Sunday morning and you walk out on that patio and the sun hits you and you're like, ah! It's like, could you fix that? No, I have not been able to tell the sun not to show up at that time every Sunday. We understand that when we're in a dark room and someone flips on the light, there is a wince factor. There is a brightness factor. And that's why a lot of times as Christ followers, as citizens of his kingdom, when we walk into a room, you might not say anything, you might not do anything, but there might be some rejection. There might be some response to those that are living in a different kind of kingdom because the darkness in the room has actually been pierced by the light of Jesus Christ in your life. There, there's some sort of response and, and they don't even know what's going on. It's not like you're pushing or you're poking the bear. It's just a matter of, that's what light does. It reveals, reveals what's lacking, reveals what's missing, reveals what's needed. I think of the moon, right? The moon reflects all the power, if you will, of the sun. It, it points to the sun as it reflects its light. And in the same way, right, our light reflects should point back to the sun, S-O-N. We are just a reflection of God's glory. And that is why we are called to be salt and light. To be opposite of that steals glory from God. It robs him of his glory because we just reflect who he is. The history of the Christian church is is pretty interesting, um, but sadly it's full of many moments where we, have lost our saltiness, where we've lost our light, where we have lost our prophetic voice, a voice that can speak out to the culture and say, this is wrong, this is not right. We've lost our prophetic voice because we've refused to be salt and light. And because of what's going on right now uh, in Russia and the Ukraine and all that stuff, I think we have a very unique season where we can reflect back on Russian history for a second. And so let me take you back. Um, The Christian church, for the most part, was kicked out of Russia during the Russian Revolution around the early 1900s. And sadly, what happened was the priesthood of the Russian church was totally corrupt, for the most part, totally corrupt. And the church wanted to maintain its status quo and keep its power by siding with the political czarist regime. And uh, so they sided with them against the exploited masses of people in the country. They wanted to keep their power. And so the church officials clearly sold their birthright as a child of God for a bowl of soup. They lost their saltiness. The salt had lost its strength And so when the revolution came, the salt was promptly cast out of the country because it was good for nothing. The church wanted to keep its power, so it compromised to keep its power. They exchanged a prophetic voice for a power voice, and in the end, they had no voice. They lost their salt. Jesus then goes on to say in verse 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. God doesn't want your faith to remain private. It is an internal work, but it always expresses itself publicly. God is robbed of glory when your salt and your light are not in full effect. I'd like for you to take up the candle that is on your seat right now. And I've got a couple of deacons that are helping me. If you can come on up, guys. And um, 
Because I believe that God has called us to be brothers and sisters that really do reveal the light that God has. He has asked us to be the light in a dark world, in a broken world, to make a difference to those around us, to be salt, to be light, all that he's called us to be. And as you live out your light, as you live out the light that God has given you, as your brother and sister lives out their light, it goes on and on and on and on. And it will get to you, and we want it to move slowly right now because this is how it actually works, right? What happens, listen to me as you pass your light around, the community, the church, it lives out that light, right? I don't want anybody getting hurt in here. (laughs) We start to live out that light. And what happens is that community becomes a city, a bright city on a hill that the darkness of our world cannot overcome, right? The darkness of our world that, that can't be ignored. The kingdom light, listen to this, so, much, so important, the kingdom light is so much brighter than the individual light. You by yourself, check this out, cannot be a city on a hill. You by yourself cannot light up the whole world. You and I need our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And guess what? Look around. They need you too. And what happens is when we are together as a gathered church, a community of faith, your candle power, your individual candle power increases a thousand fold. United as one. Come what may. Friends, let's be salt. Let's be light together, right? So others may clearly see Jesus. And if all this wasn't crazy enough, I skipped over the craziest part of the whole passage. Verse 12, Jesus says in verse 12, check it out. He says, rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven for the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice. Why? How? Because what scripture is showing us is that if you are persecuted, you can rejoice that you are now in the company of some of the greatest who ever lived out their faith. You stand, you actually hold your light alongside the greats like Isaiah and Elijah, Ruth and Esther. Your light is now connected with theirs. Rejoice, scripture says, because great is your reward in heaven. The word great there in the Greek actually means immeasurably great. Your reward is more than you could even imagine. You see, God will not permit what has been sacrificed for his glory to go unrewarded. This side or that side of eternity, God will take care of you. I want you to listen to Paul's confidence. He says this, one who was persecuted probably more than we could ever imagine. He says this, for our light and our momentary troubles. It's like, ah, these light troubles, these light whippings, these light beatings are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Verse seven, for I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. He's encouraging us to do the same. And I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize Listen, friends, the prize is not just for me. He's showing that the promise is for you as well too, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Let me tell you something, friends. We can have joy that goes beyond our present circumstances because God's prize is his presence that awaits us. He is our prize. We're going after his presence. 
And so what I'd love for you to do right now is I'd like for you to stand all over this room and holding that light as a connection to all the past faithful ones. I wanna sing a song that I believe might have been sung for hundreds of years past. Worship with us right now.